right, welcome everyone to chapter three, introduction to the derivative. And uh, now we're skipping a little bit ahead here to section number four. This is the average rate of change, and this is gonna motivate kind of why we want to study the things we're about to study. Uh, so we're doing things a little bit of out of order, but the claim is that we're actually heading towards calculus, right? So chapters one and two are this review of kind of algebraic topics. Now we're headed into the first key topic of calculus, and that's gonna be slope at a point. So we want slope at just one point, which is kind of a weird thing. So we're gonna try this out here with example 4.1. Consider this function x squared. And I wanna to try to find the slope of the function at the point x equals one. And so, all right, the slope of the function at this point. Well, if I were to try my slope formula, m, so the slope is supposed to be equal to this, maybe y2 minus y1, the change in y values, divided by the change in x values. But you can see that you need two points. You need an x value and a y value for two different points. So at when x equals one, I mean, I can certainly get a y value by plugging this into my function, right? f of one is gonna be one squared, which happens to be one. So I have the point one, one, that's an x value and a y value, but I only have that one point. It doesn't specify a second point. So I don't know exactly what to do. Um, the only thing I guess that you can really try is maybe let's let this point work for both of them, right? So let's say both my x1, y1, and my x2, y2 are both the point 1, 1. So if I try that, again, my y values are both 1, and my x values are both 1, what you get is 0 over 0, and that doesn't make so much sense. And that's why this problem says, you know, try to find the slope of the function at this one point. And so the claim is, our slope function that we know and love doesn't work when you only have one point, right? Okay, so that is the first key topic of calculus. That's where we're headed. Let's get there by talking first a little bit about the average rate of change. So example 4.2, I wanna consider this function again, x squared, and I'm gonna find the slope of the line that contains the points, zero f of zero and one f of one. So find the slope, the slope of the line that contains these points. So again, when I plug in zero into f, I'm gonna get out zero squared, that's gonna be zero. And when I plug in one into f, I get one squared, that also happens to be one. So now I have these two points, zero, zero, and one, one. That I can definitely find uh, the slope of the line that contains these two points, these two points that came from this function x squared. So again, m is gonna be this y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, change in y values divided by change in x values. So this is gonna be maybe my first point right here. So this is gonna be maybe x1 and y1. And then here's my second point. This is gonna be maybe x2 and y2. So if I go ahead and plug these things in, y2 is one, y1 is zero, x2 is one, x1 is zero, that's gonna be one over one, which happens to be a slope of one, right? Uh, and in fact, right, we can do this maybe a little bit more graphically, which I like more. If I was to go ahead and just plot these points zero, zero, and one, one, I like looking at this a lot better, right? What is my rise? My rise is one, my run is one, so the slope of the line containing these two points will rise over run, that's one divided by one, also happens to be one. So this is kind of a faster graphical way that you can think about uh, slope. So this brings up the idea, right? Because uh, we didn't do the slope of just this line, we did the slope of uh, this line that was generated by this function, x squared. So this idea, the line between two points on a graph is gonna be called something, a secant line. It's called a secant line. And I'll draw a picture here in just a second. This has something to do with this idea of average rate of change, and that's the key topic for this section, average rate of change of f of x on the interval from a to b. So let me give you the definition really quick, and then I'll give you the sketch. So the average rate of change of this function, f of x, on the interval a, b, is gonna be the change in the f values, or often you think of this as you know some y value here, that the function spits out y values. So f of b minus f of a, that's the change in the y values or the change in the f values if you'd like, divided by the length of this interval or the change in the x values. So that's gonna be b minus a. And now you may have seen this before, right? So this is called the average rate of change. This sometimes comes up uh, in your favorite algebra class. 
So let me go ahead and sketch this thing. So here's going to be a graph. Here's maybe an A value. Here's a B value. And I have some function here. This is going to be my f of x. Okay. And so I have an f of a. This is the height f of a, the function's height when x is a. And then I have f of b, the function's height when x is equal to b. All right. And so the claim is here. Let me kind of change. I want to change colors. Draw maybe red. Why not? But we have a change in heights here, f of b minus f of a. And then we also have a change in x values. Uh, maybe right here, this is the b minus a. So this is b minus a. And this here would be my f of b minus f of a. Ooh, can barely uh, fit it in there. So really, what this is telling you is a slope kind of between these two points. The average rate of change is actually the same thing as a slope of some line containing these two points. Let me actually just uh, draw it all the way in here. And that line right there, well, that's from definition 4.3. That is the secant line. So the average rate of change is the same thing as the slope of the secant line. So there's a couple different ways that I can pose questions to you. you know, find the slope of the secant line of this function between these points, or I can ask you to find me the average rate of change, whatever. But the average rate of change is a slope, right? It's on average how much is the function changing between these two x values, a to b. Okay, let's go ahead and try calculating this out in our next example. Find the average rate of change of log base 2 of x on the interval from 1 to 8. Okay. Then sketch this function and the secant line for the situation to kind of show visually what's going on here. Okay, so the average rate of change for this function is going to be f of 8 minus f of 1 divided by 8 minus 1. All right, so this is the specified interval. This is my a's and b's I just plugged in here. So I'm using that definition 4.4. The next thing is that I have a very specific function, right? Log base 2 of something. So this is going to be log base 2 of 8 minus log base 2 of 1 divided by 8 minus 1 is going to be 7. All right, how do I figure out my log base 2s, right? So actually, we can do these ones by hand, but let's pretend that I've forgotten uh, how to do this. So let me go ahead and pull out my calculator here. And I'm going to use the change of base formula. So the change of base formula says that I can go ahead and rip this part. And I'm going to do log of 8 divided by log of 2. Before I hit enter here, I want to remind ourselves that this is supposed to be the exponent that I raise 2 to in order to get 8. So the exponent that I raise 2 to in order to get 8 is going to be 3. So yes, there it is. It is indeed 3. And how about what exponent would you raise 2 to in order to get 1? Well, I would raise it to the 0 power. But let's pretend uh, that I forget this, or maybe I'm just not so confident yet with the logarithms. That's fine, too. So log of 1 divided by log of 2, enter. Yes, I should raise 2 to the 0th power in order to get 1. All right. So again, that's 3 minus 0 divided by 7. So that's going to be three sevenths. So that is my average rate of change of this function on the interval from one to eight. Okay, now let's sketch this function uh, and actually also the secant line to show what the situation is kind of representing graphically. Okay, so the first thing, I want to sketch this function f of x. Now that's uh, maybe a little bit hard. Of course, I already know a couple values because I've evaluated out at eight and at one. So I know, for instance, these two points at 1, uh, it spits out 0. And at 8, it spits out 3. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, it spits out 3. But let's go ahead and use our calculator to uh, help us graph this thing. So I'm going to go back to my calculator. Let me move it off here a little bit over to this other side. And remember, I don't have log base 2 of x, but I can use the change of base formula. So I'm going to do log 
of x divided by log of 2. And I'm going to go ahead and try to graph this. I think mine was zoomed way, way out from before. Let's see what happens if I do a zoom fit. Sometimes this works. I find about half the time it actually does a good job. The other half of the time, eh, not so much. This time it did okay. Okay, but for graphing things, I really like to use the table. So I'm gonna do second graph to get the table. Uh, and you can see, first of all, it doesn't make any sense if you try to plug in negatives. We know the domain of a logarithm is uh, strictly bigger than zero. So we know at one, it spits out zero. At two, it's gonna spit out one. So I can go ahead and start plotting a little bit. Oh, this is gonna make me go back and forth. That's kind of annoying, but okay. At four, it's gonna spit out two. So something like this. And then from there, just kind of looking at the shape of the graph, right? If I was to go back and look at the graph, uh, it kind of looks like this, right? Again, it doesn't really make sense when you're uh, less than zero. Let's do zoom out really quick. Zoom out. All right, now you're zoomed out. You can kind of see the shape of the graph here. So let's go ahead and try to sketch this. And in fact, we've seen logarithms. We've explored these things a little bit. So we know what kind of the general shape is and the fact that they have this asymptote at zero. So it's gonna go way, way down, something like this. And so now I'm gonna go ahead and plot these two important pieces. Uh, so, I mean, kind of the points that we were really interested in was here at one and here at eight. And so let me draw the secant line and I'll draw the secant line maybe in green. So this is the secant line between these two points here. Going off the page a little bit, not a very great straight line. Um, so this is the secant line, right? So this is telling you on average, how much is this function changing on this interval from one to eight? So that's what the average rate of change is telling us, right? It kind of makes sense based on the name. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on a little bit to a little bit of an application. So. Yes, we'll pretend here that in uh, 2000, Ryan started a business, Ryan's Friendly Board Game Emporium. Uh, and so the left is a table of the total number of board games I've sold since then, so since uh, starting the company here in 2000. Um, so as of December 31st of each year anyway. So how many board games did Ryan sell between December 31st, 2010 and December 31st, 2016? So here's 2010 and here's 2016. So again, this is a total since I started the company. So how many board games did Ryan sell between then? In fact, let me go back, I'd like blue. Well, I'm gonna subtract these numbers, right? Because this is a grand total right here. So if I wanna know how many board games did I sell between 2016 and 2010, I'm gonna subtract. So this is gonna be 2256, uh, 2256 board games minus 512 board games. And just so I don't embarrass myself, I'm going to go ahead and pull out the calculator really quick. Uh, so I can quit. And 2256 minus 512. Oh, yeah. 2256 minus, see the signs are a little bit different. 512. All right, 1744. So 1,744, and this has units, right? Anytime you can include units, please do. So this is board games, 1,744 board games. So then the question becomes, well, on average, how many board games, right, did Ryan sell in this six-year period between December 31st, 2010 and December 31st, 2016? So this is an average rate of change, right? On average, how many board games uh, did Ryan sell? So again, uh, this is going to be y values. You can think about this. Subtract those away. Divided by x values. So 2016 minus 2010. And of course, we've already calculated this up here, 1744. And this is over a six year span, right? So really, we're just taking the total number of board games and dividing by that number of years. And remember, let's write out some units here. This is going to be board games. In the bottom here, this uses units years. 
So, yep, so board games per year, essentially. Now let's go ahead and, oops, not that one. I want to go ahead and calculate out a specific number, so let's go ahead and pull this up, and I'm going to divide by 6 here. And so that's uh, 290.67. So 290.67 board games, oops, there we go, per year. Okay, at least during that span. You can see kind of at the beginning, uh, I wasn't selling very many board games at all, right? So in 2000, I only sold three board games. In 2001, it looks like I sold eight more to get to 11, so on and so forth. So, okay, but later on, it seems like I'm doing pretty well. And then finally, use our answer from B to approximate how many board games uh, you would expect that I sold in just one month. So that's January of 2011. The claim is, well, if I sold 290.67 board games every single year, how much would I sell in one month? Well, it looks like I'm going to divide that by 12, right? So let's go ahead and bring up our calculator again. And uh, let me show my work, right? Showing your work is very important. So 290.67 divided by 12. That's how I'm going to be getting my answer. So let's do that. So I'll take my answer and I will divide that by 12 to see how much I sold in just one month. So that'd be 24.22 board games. And that's how many I would expect to sell every single month uh, between 2010 and 2016, approximately. Again, using my answer from B. Okay, so that's how you can use this. This is how average rate of change sometimes sneak into real world situations. Uh, and the final thing I wanted to remark on is that the average rate of change has kind of predictable units, right? So the average rate of change uh, of f of x on our interval from a to b has units, uh, units of f divided by units of x. So you can see in our example back here, our f, our function, was really the total number of board games sold. So my units were board games. My x value, my independent variable was years. So that's why when I go over here for B, when I calculated out this average rate of change, my units were board games per year, right? So this is not a coincidence. This always happens to be, you know, units of F, whatever that happens to be, divided by units of X. All right, that's it for this video. I'll see you next time when we go circle back to 3.1. All right, I'll see you then.